Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And today we are reviewing, yes, this, the, uh, oh, this is the so-called Seikona. <laughs> uh, this came out in 2001. I have been avoiding any kind of other reviews about this, like the plague. I knew I'd eventually get to it because of course my favorite uh, Seiko is the ultra affordable Flightmaster chronograph, which in my opinion is the gold standard of affordable uh, chronographs. We'll get into all of that why, uh, because of course it's going to come up in conversation for many, many reasons. I'll do a quick wristwatch check wearing the Pepsi and you'll notice it's on the Oyster. This is actually from my Tudor Submariner. Now, before we get into this, I'm going to give a massive shout out and uh, thanks to Moya Fine Jewelers for lending this in and allowing me well, as much time as I want to get to know it. Anyway, there's a lot to talk about. So uh, let's start with a little bit of context. When it came to mechanical watches, the early innovators in this field were undoubtedly the Brits, French and Swiss. If you saw my Navitimer review, you might remember Breitling's contributions to creating the first pusher and crown setup that most chronograph wristwatches employ to this day. This was way back in the beginning of the 20th century. It wasn't until the late 60s that Seiko began their quest to dominate this complication by racing against the Swiss to see who could produce the world's first automatic chronograph with their entry into the race with the calibre 6139. Whilst many acknowledge Zenith with their high beat El Primero movement crossing the finish line first in 1969, others credit a coalition of Swiss brands that came together with a joint venture nicknamed Project 99 for the win. Well, the jury is still out on that one. However, unlike their more expensive Swiss counterparts, the Seiko 6139 became a watch legend in an entirely different way by being the first automatic chronograph famously worn by Colonel William Pogue into space in 1973. But what also makes this remarkable is the fact that Seiko was simultaneously developing the revolutionary quartz technology while competing in this race to create the first automatic chronograph. We all know what happened in the subsequent decades, of course. Their swift market dominance following the quartz crisis enabled what I call the golden age of Seiko. In 1983, they introduced the world's first analog quartz chronograph with the legendary 7A28 movement. Being so relatively affordable, super durable compared to its mechanical rivals and deadly accurate, it was chosen by the British RAF and officially issued to their pilots. But perhaps most famously of all, a civilian version was worn by 007 himself, making it a pop culture icon too. This is just the beginning of an era of Seiko that would see them manufacturing some of the most innovative and audacious watches of all time. It's crazy to think that back in the day, I spent 120 bucks on my flight master. That's how much it cost uh, to me. I really think the way things are going, if it hasn't been discontinued already, it's going that way. If you're on the fence about it, honestly, snap them up while you still can. Size-wise, you could hardly ask for better from this stainless steel watch. I initially was quite surprised at just how refreshingly small it was when I first got it out of the box. It wears very much like the Flightmaster, despite being 3mm smaller at a 39mm diameter. That's mainly due to having a very similar modest lug-to-lug -lug size. However, it's much tubbier in stature, which gives it more of a presence on my 6.5 inch wrist. The height is also boosted by the curved sapphire crystal that has anti-reflective coating on the inner surface. The weight is substantial, mainly due to the thick three-piece and very slightly tapering bracelet. We get a useful 100 meter depth rating here without a screw down crown or screw down pushers, which is rare in the chronograph. There is only one micro adjustment position, but aside from that, the double push button signed clasp is quite solid and does a good job of securely fastening the watch. We will talk about the luminescence later, so let's look at the movement. 
Underneath the screw case back is the outstanding solar powered Calibre V192. This is a well proven, extremely durable and very capable movement, first introduced in the early 2000s in Seiko's diving chronographs. This was mainly due to its rugged and dependable reliability in conditions where there might be drastic variations in temperature changes, which typically occurs more so with diving watches. The accuracy is plus or minus 15 seconds a month. It features hacking, a nicely tucked away quick set date, and on a full charge can last up to an impressive six months. It's important to note here that Seiko states that this power reserve is based on if you only use the 60 minute capable chronograph for less than one hour a day. Most nifty of all is the six o'clock subdial transforms into a power reserve indicator when the chrono is not in use. It displays three positions, low meaning you have less than 48 hours of power, medium meaning two to 100 days, and full charge meaning 100 days or more. This is insanely efficient and combined with the one fifth of a second increments to the tick of the main seconds hand, Along with the split time measurement function, as a measuring tool, it performs very precisely and very responsively. For those who favor the traditionalism of mechanical watches, that sweep also makes one kind of forget it's a quartz. One massive advantage to the performance of this watch, which, you know, utterly obliterates anything mechanical, that anti-shock resistance uh, compared to mechanical movements, because obviously you don't have all the uh, complex moving parts, more things going wrong, or the chance of more things going wrong. With a solar movement like this, if you actually think about it, for a racing car driver that deals with a lot of vibration, this is a true tool. So I respect that it's in the prospects line. It makes absolute sense. The design of this watch is without a doubt its most interesting aspect. If you know anything about watches, or Seiko for that matter, it's painfully obvious where its inspiration came from. The almost tonneau shaped case is more akin to a rectangle with rounded corners rather than the more typical circular case. This is clearly a nod to the early 1969 chronographs that housed the legendary 6139. However, things get very modern very quickly as we move up to the sloping ceramic tachymeter bezel. The circular brushed finish and contrasting crisp white engraved markings that are filled in with paint is unequivocally reminiscent of the contemporary Rolex Daytonas. However, here Seiko have cleverly added a flat inner section to the bezel, unlike the sloping Daytona bezel. This simple but effective change adds a logical way that separates the inner markings to the outer numbers they correspond with, and also frames the crystal nicely. The bezel, combined with the V-shaped compact layout of the subdials, is what gives it the Daytona look, essentially, resulting in its unfortunate nickname, the Seikona. And I say unfortunate because, in my opinion, Seiko's history of making chronographs is a lot more prestigious, varied, and important than the Rolex this resembles. The six o'clock subdial is pleasingly equidistantly balanced by the Prospects and Applied brand logo, signifying its shift from an entry level chrono to something more of a professional racing tool. At first glance, the watch does seem rather simple, especially compared to my super busy beloved Flighty, but actually there is rather a lot going on on the dial. Firstly, the solar cells are cleverly incorporated into the recessed subdials. This not only gives them a different shine to the matte, grainy, almost charcoal grey main dial, but works aesthetically well, as sometimes it's kind of glossy and even has a blue hue in certain lights, typical of solar panels. At the periphery is the finely printed seconds and minute track, complete with numerals you almost hardly notice. A subtle but functional detail that works in conjunction with the beat rate of the main ticking chrono seconds. This is then interrupted by applied high polish wedge style faceted markers for the hours. We will return to that in just a moment. But lastly we should address its stylistic versatility, with its relative simplicity compared to the flighty, along with the monochromatic colour scheme, it easily demonstrates that urban gentry trademark saying of strap monster 
status. There's hardly a strap or bracelet combo that this watch will not work with. These days, the value rarely is, in my opinion, in the micro brands. Look at what, you know, Laurier, Ferrer, which we recently reviewed, Hemel especially. I think Hemel probably offers the best value when it comes to affordable uh, chronographs, especially mechanical around the $500 mark. Amazing seagull column wheel movements in there. So yeah, that's where the real value is. Of course, not proprietary made like Seiko is. I just think you get something with a bit more individualism, a bit more pizzazz, more bang for your buck, so to speak. As with any new Seiko, there's almost as many negatives as positives. Now let's just get the typical pin and collar connected links of the bracelet out of the way. It's 2022 as I speak these words and nobody should be paying over $500 for such a cheap dated shortcut. Others might complain at the slightly jingly jangly quality of the bracelet, but to be honest, I think it's perfectly fine. My biggest complaint is the shockingly stingy application of Lumi Bright Luminescence. There is nothing wrong with Seiko's proprietary compound itself, but with half the amount of markers featuring Lume compared to the Flightmaster, orientation and reading the hours with precision and quickly in low light is very disappointing. If the speed timers of the 1960s got it right, then fast forward more than half a century, this is a big step back. And I really don't get it. There's plenty of space for it. They could have easily applied Lume to the markers, so a big detriment to its functionality here. The diminutive arrow of the seconds hand does not help the situation either. The proportions were much better, again, on the flighty. Thankfully, the pencil style hour and minute hands seem to be the same scale as the Flightmaster. The third complaint, and I'm not alone here, is the 24 hour indicator at the three o'clock sub dial. Sure, I get it, it's part and parcel of this particular caliber, but unless you are an astronaut or a cave explorer or in some kind of situation where you need to tell day from night because there is no real world reference, it feels like a wasted complication. Now this watch was released along with a slew of other offerings to celebrate 140 years of Seiko. So why not use the occasion to introduce a new movement, a modified version based on the V192 with a more useful complication to make use of that valuable dial space. Or you could simply have a day date and a single two-handed subdial at the six and truly make a Pogue reissue that we have all been waiting for. But just imagine it, a modern Pogue affordable with that fantastic usability, affordability and precision of a solar movement. Again, back to the flighty that packed a nifty two-handed subdial at the six, which not only could be used to track an independent second time zone, but also an alarm function too. We all know these days Seiko is adjusting itself across all price points for inflation and the good old days of market beating ultra compelling value with many overlooked gems at the affordable entry level is certainly over. I feel we very much had it a bit too good for too long. This watch feels to me generally incomplete. I myself would be willing to pay more, closer to a grand, and see all that extra money going into fixing everything we just talked about. I feel that they are trying to do two things at the same time. Trying to be still affordable and not push up the price too much, and only giving it semi-upgrades like sapphire, glass, etc. in order to keep it within a certain budget. In my opinion, it's better to commit and go all the way and offer a fully realized product or go the opposite and do something super cheap and cheerful, Moonswatch style. Okay, we are here at the Navy Yard in Philadelphia, beautiful place to come and shoot some outside footage because I wanted to get this watch in different light. It plays very differently outside compared to the light box. I've also brought with me a few watches. I'm not going to do gear check like I did in the Squire review video because I'm using the same setup, although a little addendum about the Carl Friedrich Bowen backpack. The inside pockets are perfect because I had to bring with me the Hemel airfoil and the Flightmaster so you can actually store these watches in those pockets. It's absolutely perfect. 
It's no secret that I love Seiko. My favorite watches might be from other brands, but my favorite watchmaker is always Seiko. So naturally, I want them to do better. I want them to succeed. Or maybe I just expect or simply care too much. I feel for such an auspicious occasion that it is generally a missed opportunity. Sure, the watch is solidly built, great quality and finishing for the most part. If you have one, I'm sure you will love it. It's by no means a bad watch in the least. And as a sports racing watch, it does exactly what it says on the tin. But why it falls short can be rarely illustrated if we look back to a period of history and contextualize. Look at Seiko's golden age during the 80s and 90s. Now, I've done many videos on this era, so have a look back. But essentially, it was a period of immense creative and technological innovation. A mini renaissance of design and portable wrist technology. The best example was the Giugiaro Design Speedmaster series that took Seiko's cutting-edge tech of the time into new revolutionary directions with more daring experiments in form and function. Seiko did this themselves too. Just look at our beloved Flightmaster, itself a simplification of its more adventurous and even busier 7T34 based predecessor. The reason we always keep coming back to the flighty is that it represents the last of a dying generation. And don't get me wrong, it's far from perfect, with its annoying 21mm lug width and frustratingly stubby lugs that make strap changes an absolute pain. But it represents the bookend or the final chapter of that age. Thankfully, this new speed timer does not have any of the issues I just mentioned. But the flighty offered so much for so little. I mean, the fact that both pushers and the crown were screwable, it had an astounding 200 meter depth rating. This was something I'd never seen in an aviation watch, let alone a sporting chrono. It was overbuilt, almost overdesigned. The mastery of the chrono complication in quartz by Seiko can never really be downplayed. A lot of the following technology was built on the back of this and Seiko's focus then shifted to pioneering any digi, digital, eventually hybrids like spring drive and so on. The result was decades of movie icons, the choice of racing legends, and over half a century of being an official international sports timekeeper. So now you can start to see why I had such high expectations. Really 007. This is not a disappointing watch because it's a bad watch. It's a great watch. It's a disappointment because compared to everything that came before, it does nothing new. Makes me think of that fantastic line from the movie A Bronx Tale. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. All right, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Please don't forget to add your comments down below, your opinions. What do you think Seiko did right? What do you think they did wrong? What would you like to see from Seiko at this price range? Yeah, share all that good stuff in the comments below. Uh, don't forget to like this video. Very important indeed if you want to see more free, independent content like this. Don't forget to share this video with your friends, and I will catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Ciao.